everybody. Um, we have, as you can see, a new book out this week on the 30th of November, so on Saturday. We are releasing Driving For by Philip Augie. Uh, Driving Philip Augie is the author of The Red Dust, and this is his second book, a book of short stories that tell the story of a regional centre in Australia and through the eyes of Scott, a cab driver. And we see this town through the fares that Scott picks up. Um, some of these fares are singular, some of these fares are, have multiple trips, but through them we learn all about the town. So Driving For is out very shortly. You can order a copy right now on the Black Cocky Press website where you can also order any of our other books um, and any of our writing services. If you would like to support us, that is how you support us. Uh, you can also support us by going to our Redbubble shop where there are over 100 designs. I'm sure you would find something there that might uh, serve as a nice little Christmas present for somebody perhaps. But uh, that being out of the way, remember, um, if you want to support us without spending any money, of course, like, subscribe, comment and share. So without further ado, here is the first story from Driving For. It is called Scott. It is Scott Part One. And here we go. The road headed north away from Sydney. It was taking me away from the buildings that I saw as a cancer upon the earth. I wanted to see the earth again. It was taking me away from a gloomy winter where the cold accentuated my unhappy mood. Descending onto the bridge crossing the Hawkesbury River, the afternoon sun of an early spring day beamed gaily upon the shimmering water. An endless forest of gum trees lined the slopes into the, on, into the large river. The expanse of water gave me a taste of space that I had been fantasizing about. I could see nature at last. It was taking me away from the confused behavior of the many people who were always wanting for something. They were never happy. They were never at peace. Their views were restricted by the buildings. The wall on the other side of the street locked them into a very insular cocoon. I found myself descending into the daily routine they all suffered from. I was becoming trapped again. I needed to escape and recognise this was not for me. I was looking for my peace of mind again. It was not to be found on this busy expressway, the little metal boxes with motors filled, filed around me as if to trap me in again. They had no care for the other metal boxes. It did not register that inside that anonymous metal cage, metallic cage, was another soul. It was all about them and their wants. I stayed in the slow lane. I was not in a hurry. I had the rest of my life ahead of me. Time was not an issue as it was to these rushing past me. I was free to do whatever I wished at any time. I liked it that way. About the time when I'd had enough of, other, of the other boxes' impatience, I noticed a sign heading off this freeway, pointing inland. I hoped it would take me away from the confusion and aggression of this current path. The bypass brought me onto what was obviously a newer road. I could tell because the surface was much smoother. I crossed through a series of wooden sloping hills. The ever-increasing wattle blossoms seemed to act as a forerunner to something glorious beyond these hills. Soon I could see that the horizon was going to open up to a more conge congenial, expansive scene. I was impatient to see that. The gum tree forests gave way to more open paddocks. Green fields occupied with livestock started to fill the scene. The change was happening. I began to feel more relaxed. Turn-offs to other villages and towns adorned the way and I wandered 
wondered about them. It was later in the afternoon and although the traffic heading in my direction west was much less than the previous freeway heading north, the traffic heading east was quite pronounced. I wondered why. Another turn off to another village and the road started to climb slowly. The forest, featuring a different species of gum trees and pines, enclosed the sides, side of the roads as if leading me onto a horizon beyond this hill. The path was obvious by the increasing number of metal boxes heading in the opposite direction. The pinnacle of the hill was heralded by a service station on the left. I paid it little attention as I was in expectation of the view soon to be opened. The trees diminished and open paddocks enlightening the way to a vast horizon developing as the summit was reached. The vastness of the opening blue sky was only matched by the beauty of the scene now displayed before me, where the sky met the earth to my left and to my right with hills. They were increasingly taller and further the, the further the distance to them. They headed northwest like parallel lines that did not did meet at the horizon. They were the sentinels to what was a very large valley. I could feel my mind expanding across the now open fields as I descended the gentle slope. A joy was invading my soul and I enjoyed the freedom this view offered. The descending slope revealed a vast flat plain expanding before me. Upon closer inspection, the soil was black. This could only mean that it was a river flat. Yet I could not see a river, so vast was this plain. Agriculture abounded, lucerne, vegetables, cereals and livestock. A food bowl revealed itself before my eyes. To my right, the flat plain extended. The river must have been in the direct, that direction out of sight. To my left, a small hill rose, as if to be a sibling to the one I had just ascended. As I glanced upon the slopes of the hill, there stood two ornate early Victorian mansions. The view from these dwellings would have been magnificent. Given their age, they were possibly the result of successful pioneers to this district. The question then beckoned, what was this district like before the white man invaded? Certainly these two rather English looking buildings would have been very out of place to what the landscape was. They seemed to exhibit a mystery, unknown facts that intrigued me. A railway line now ran parallel to the highway to my left, so close at times that its presence held command. The mansions were now lost from view by the embankment of the railway line, obscured by progress. Still the onslaught of the oncoming traffic continued, if anything increasing. Where were they all coming from? The embankment levelled out so I could see the left side scenery. On the far side of this view portrayed a shape that could be indicative of only one activity. A water reserve poked itself above the savannah in the shape of a wine glass. I had seen these before. They were standard issue to all military bases. So this area was protected by the armed forces. Maybe this was where the car, all the cars these cars were coming from. The answer was quickly answered as I passed an intersection with a sign pointing to an army base, but no excess of cars filing from this road leading to the right. The army base was not the reason for all the car, these cars headed opposite me. As, a, as suddenly as it appeared, the railway line to my left headed to, to another direction away from the highway. I noticed billboards, some professionally done, some with thumbnail dipped in tar. They were all displaying seemingly important information about ways for travellers to part with their money. This could only mean one thing, which was confirmed with the speed limit sign reading 80 kilometres an hour. I was entering a town. The paddocks gave way to businesses, car sale yards, motels, service stations, all lined the thoroughfare as to herald that this town, this was a town of significance. Another indication was that, although I had had a good run coming into the town, it had now stopped. Stopped it was for no visible, visible reason, just stopped. The little traffic I had encountered travelling in my direction had now trapped me in. On the other side of the road, the steady stream continued as like a river with a leaking reservoir as the headwater. 
Moving again slowly, it soon became apparent why the slowdown. Two sets of lights now appeared, and I wondered if I should be able to get through them both before the lights changed. No such luck. Stopped again. It was obvious that this highway was the greatest obstacle in this town. Any good travelling time made before this town was now lost by the congestion the highway presented. I wondered what the local people thought of this maze of metallic boxes invading their space on a regular basis. I had been driving for long enough on this day. The sun was getting low and time for a break. I had no deadline to keep and this town seemed like a suitable resting place. I wanted to see what the, this town was like away from the highway. The dual traffic lights loomed still green, but I could see once past them that the congestion continued. I had had enough. Capturing the first of the lights, I indicated a left turn to hopefully lead me to see what this town was really like. The new street was lined with houses, nothing elaborate, but certainly a different style to what I had been used to in Sydney. Each house displayed a different design and thus seeming, seemingly personality. Their age varied and this seemed to give an indication to their character. They all had large spaces, spacious yards as opposed to the multi-congestion of Sydney dwellings I had come from. I envisaged this extra room to, to the abodes gave rise to happier inhabitants. It was a long street with stop, with stop sign on the cross streets. Registering that this street was of importance. In the distance, I could see that the street was going to end in a T intersection. It loomed at an angle. Not knowing the local rules, I thought it prudent to turn left as that angle was broader. Looking to my right, it became obvious that this was the main street with lots of shops, cars and people. Further, there was a large shopping centre opposite. I turned left and spying a park on the right beyond the shopping centre decided that this is where I wanted to go. Indicator on, I waited for a taxi to turn right in the direction I wanted to go. I followed the vehicle till it dis turned into the shopping centre. I wondered upon the people the driver had encountered on this day's driving, what the driver had learned about this town. The greenery of the park revealed itself as well as a little road that lead that led into the park proper. That is where I went and parked, under a large deciduous tree, enjoying the new growth spring had provided. I could feel the peace of this place invading my soul. I was becoming more relaxed again. The solace I had found had slowed, slowed time to the extent that it was no longer relevant. The spell was being brought back to reality by an invading noise that continued to grow. Behind me was the railway line, which had obviously traversed around the town, and it was from there that the noise emulated. It became overpowering, and as the object of the noise became visible, it revealed itself to be three locomotives pulling many, many coal trucks. The riddle of many and of the many and many cars heading east had been answered, along with the obvious agricultural presence in this district and army and the army base. It was the coal in this area that gave it its prosperity. When I was entering the town, it must have been knockoff time at the coal mines, hence the traffic congestion. The workers were heading east from their pit as their day's work headed east towards the port. If you would like to support this channel, come across to the Black Cocky Press website www.blackcockypress.com.au where you will find books and other writing services to help with your writing.